we have a lot of tools and that is the basic metabolism just uh, sequester oxygen so that they don't get uh, oxygen and then uh, in itself is, is uh, highly protective and promotes a certain type of microbiota composition we have a lot of tools and uh, nobody seems to talk about uh, this everybody seems to talk about eating fibers short chain fatty acids in your stool which is completely unimportant who the hell cares about uh, the fatty acid short chain fatty acid content of your stool uh, what what's really important is the short chain fatty acid content of your blood welcome to the fat emperor podcast i'm your host ivor cummins we're supported by the irish heart disease awareness charity which advocates a simple CT scan to reveal your CAC score. So know your score and take action to prevent that premature heart attack. Everything you need to know will be right here. Hey everyone, Ivor Cummins here, AKA the Fat Emperor, and we're bringing you another free podcast for your enjoyment. We only ask one thing, if you go to ihda.ie, the website, and scroll down to the bottom of the home page and share using the social media buttons. So this podcast is kept free by being funded by Irish Heart Disease Awareness. So we really need you to pause the video, pop on to ihda.ie and help us get the message out there on the calcification scan for middle risk people. Today we're back with an old favorite, Gabor Erdosi. And we're going to talk about leaky gut and some of this microbiome stuff that's getting everyone very excited. So I'm really looking forward to hearing all about that from Gabor. Hey, Gabor, how are you doing? Hey, Ivor, I'm doing fine. Thank you. I hope you are doing well, too, after a lot of traveling. But uh, finally, we are here and uh, discussing something purportedly important. <laughs> I like that. Purportedly important. Well, yeah, actually, I was sent a video by Dr. Stephen Gundry the other day, and he was uh, promoting a new uh, nutraceutical he had or multiple uh, nutraceutical ingredients in a miracle kind of cure for leaky gut. And it was a 40 minute advertising video. I watched some of it. But yeah, pretty much pointing to leaky gut being the be all and end all, essentially. So I think the leaky gut is a really important thing, particularly if plant foods can cause the boundaries to break down and allow in proteins or endotoxins. I'm sure it's, it's a major problem for some people. But you were looking at papers recently and kind of getting into what it's really about when it may be an issue, when it may not be. So maybe you can kick off with your own kind of high level summary. In fact, I believe that there's a lot of confusion about what leaky gut is. And uh, actually, I don't even think that when problems start, it's a problem of, uh, of uh, the classical leaky gut. Um, I, I think that uh, leaky gut, the, the classical, yeah, let's define what's, what a classical leaky gut is. Uh, you have an uh, intestinal barrier kind of a layer of uh, intestinal cells covering the, the, the wall of your intestines. It's called epithelial cells. And uh, the leaky gut is defined that uh, some things in the lumen, so within the, the pipe of your intestinal uh, system, uh, some things which, are, which shouldn't uh, invade your system just uh, leak through uh, the, 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 the intestinal barrier. It meaning that uh, just among uh, or between the cells, they gain access to, to the systemic circulation. Uh, and and it's, it's scientifically, it's, it's called para, paracellular. Paracellular meaning that uh, between the cells. And uh, in fact, I believe and very strongly believe it's kind of a scientific conviction already that uh, this is not what happens early in, uh, in the, the process of uh, having problems uh, and inter intestinal inflammation due to bad food, uh, environmental contaminants and a lot of other things can cause this. So let's make it clear that uh, when we talk about leaky gut and when most people talk about uh, leaky gut, it's not really a classical problem of uh, your gut really uh, letting in uh, things that are totally not uh, intended to to enter the, the systemic circulation. So I think it's part of the part of the confusion, 
and uh, what what initially happens is that people develop a kind of a dysbiosis. Uh, the, uh, the name of uh, uh, changing microbiota, microbial strain composition in in the in the intestines. Uh, you know that the, the intestines are full of uh, microbiota, a little lower in density in the upper small intestines and higher in density in the lower. Uh, intestines in the bowels and um, but actually uh, what what really happens is that uh, some things can really alter the composition of the, the microbiota and then uh, it causes a kind of a little bit of inflammation and uh, this uh, altered microbiota start releasing a lot of uh, stuff uh, for example it's called lipopolysaccharide it's a component of the component of the bacterial uh, cell wall in the gram negative uh, bacterial cell wall and refined grains and and simple sugars for example can alter the small intestinal microbiota in a way that uh, these uh, lipopolysaccharide uh, producing strains uh, are uh, in much higher numbers than uh, in a normal uh, microbiota. So this lipopolysaccharide, uh, the production is is increased. And uh, another problem is initially is not a problem that this lipopolysaccharide can gain ac access, can go through the intestinal barrier, and uh, it it is done so by uh, being taken up into so-called chylomicrons. And uh, chylomicrons are one kind of uh, lipoproteins meaning that all the lipids which are not water soluble are uh, sequestered into this uh, chylomicron so this is actually how uh, the release of uh, digested lipids uh, enter the, the the system and not the systemic circulation not not the blood initially but into the lymph so the lymph uh, circulation these uh, the the intestinal epithelial cells take up lipids when you eat fat then it's, it mainly consists of, uh, of uh, triglycerides. And these triglycerides are broken down to uh, free fatty acids and monoacyl glycerol, which means that only one uh, fatty acid is esterified to, to the glycerol backbone. And uh, these uh, partially broken down lipids are taken up by the, by the epithelial cells. And then they form this uh, chylomicron, the, the lipoprotein, and uh, basically making it water soluble. And then this uh, chylomicron is uh, secreted on the other side of the intestinal wall into the lymph, uh, lymphatic uh, circulation. So long chain fatty acids are not uh, delivered directly to the liver, but they are taken up into the lymphatic system. And uh, the lymphatic system is also known for its role in the immune cell uh, distribution and its role in the in immune function. And it's no coincidence. Uh, I believe that uh, this has evolved uh, precisely uh, due to the reason that uh, these lipopolysaccharide and other bacterial fragments taken up together with long chain fatty acids uh, can be neutralized. Uh, by the immune system. So when, when you absorb uh, lipids and secrete it on the other side of the intestinal wall into chylomicrons, what happens is that they uh, first uh, go through uh, several filters, immune filters. There, are, there is already a huge immune system uh, in, the, in the, the intestinal wall. Uh, the, the, the biggest uh, part of your immune system resides uh, within the intestinal wall. And then you have the intestine-associated uh, uh, immune uh, organs or immune uh, parts. For example, uh, one is the, the mesentery, or uh, people usually just call it uh, belly fat or visceral fat or whatever. But it, it actually hosts uh, lymph nodes, which are... Uh, which are part of the immune system, and the second uh, filtering layer of, uh, of the, the lymphatics coming from, from the intestines. And then uh, these enter the systemic circulation, and uh, then uh, so some of it enters the uh, 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 
eventually reaches the liver and the liver has another layer of uh, filter when, when uh, this uh, blood enters the liver then uh, there is another layer of, uh, of uh, filtration a lot of uh, so-called copper cells which are basically macrophages liver sp specific macrophages and uh, you have this uh, multiple layer of uh, filtration and one can only wonder why it has evolved uh, this way so that uh, there are so many filters and of course when you understand that uh, you have all these microbes trillions of microbes uh, within your digestive system inherently some uh, parts or even some microbes can make it through the, the intestinal barrier you need uh, a lot of filters to to get rid of them so that's yeah. that's that's important for understanding how how a healthy system works i always like to start at uh, understanding the anatomy and, and basic physiology so that uh, you, you can better get a grasp of um, of disease how, how the healthy physiology uh, altered Absolutely, Gabor. That's a great kind of run through there. So maybe if I just parse it out then, you mentioned up front about the lipopolysaccharide, uh, these bacterial elements, and by eating simple sugars excessively, you can very much promote the biome or, or the bacteria in your gut, which would increase LPS or lipopolysaccharide. And they're the things you ideally don't want going across your gut barrier into your bloodstream, but they do get across. So one way to minimize the leaky gut problem would be by fewer simple sugars, I guess. The other, then you moved on to, I suppose, the lipoproteins, the chylomicrons that take the energy from your food that you eat. They bring it across the gut lining into the lymph system, not the bloodstream. And there you can actually pass these monoglycerides true to be used as fuel etc but also inside i suppose if within your stomach and your gut your intestine that's non-self that's the outside world to you but inside behind your gut lining you've got this organ which some people think of as belly fat but it's an organ that wraps around the intestine and it's a fatty organ called the mesentery yeah, I call it mesentery, but uh, my English pronunciation is, of course, not a guidance how to... It, it this, in this case, it is, Gabor, because I believe it is mesentery, so we'll fix that. But you've got this organ wrapped around the, uh, the intestine, and that's actually a clearinghouse of sorts, so that when bacteria do get through your gut uh, and lipopolysaccharide, you've got an immune-type organ a fatty organ, the mesentery, that can be the first shield to dealing and managing with these kind of toxins. Uh, whereas, of course, the uh, glycerides and the fatty energy can pass through and be used through the lymph system. And then you mentioned when you get to the liver, you've got a second barrier. Uh, you've got cells that basically have macrophage to deal with bacteria at the liver level. And it's a further safety system, I guess. And it makes sense to me, Gabor, because as we evolved, you know, the outside world, the non-self, is very threatening, not just with tigers and whatnot, but of course, all the microbes and viruses. So to have multiple layers of immune activity makes absolute sense to be a very robust system, right? Yeah, uh, I, I think it, it has uh, evolved uh, to deal with uh, high loads from time to time and it seems that uh, these times when we when, when uh, the body experiences high loads uh, happens when you eat uh, simple sugars and fats uh, together which actually rarely happens in uh, in nature but you can still you are still able to deal with a certain threshold of uh, of this uh, mixing so some some sugars starches and and uh, and lipids but uh, it seems that the the very basic problem of, uh, of modern metabolic diseases, at least those uh, that uh, are initiated by food, uh, it's a problem of uh, exceeding that threshold of uh, mixing uh, simple sugars and, and lipids. So, uh, and, and lipids are, are actually necessary to, to do that, to, to, to be part of the, the problem because uh, lipids are necessary 
for, for the enhanced uptake of uh, lipopolysaccharides. So as, as we just briefly mentioned uh, during the introduction, um, these lipopolysaccharides are taken up together with long chain fatty acids and, and mainly uh, with long, long chain fatty acids. So this, this kind of also explains why extremely low fat diets can, can work. Because even if you maintain a high lipopolysaccharide producing uh, gut flora in a, a small intestinal microbiota, uh, you, you don't have a big problem because the translocation of uh, lipopolysaccharides, the, the access gaining capability of, of uh, this bacterial debris is, is still low due to the right. lack of long chain fatty acids. And uh, yeah. when, when you are on a ketogenic diet, uh, you have a high lipid uptake and uh, potentially these lipopolysaccharides could be taken up in a, in a huge number, but you lack the, the LPS producer microbiota due to the fact that you are not eating almost any carbs, not to mention simple sugars. So uh, you have a microbiota that uh, doesn't promote uh, LPS uh, pr production. And, and uh, this can explain why you have uh, particular problems in the middle, which is often called the, the swamp land of, of, uh, of uh, diets. Excellent. Now, that, that's really cool, Gabor, because this has come up the Kempner rice diet and these very high carb, ultra low fat diets that can achieve insulin sensitivity and reasonable health. Now I would call them to question for long term nutrient value, but which is quite a separate thing. But a short term, very high carb, a low ultra low fat diet can get someone more insulin sensitive and they may feel quite better. Now the mechanism we talked some time ago about simple sugars, especially mixed with fats is a terrible combination to release GIP in the upper intestine, right? And that's a, not a good thing. And also to have lower GLP-1 down the intestine. But that was very much a hormonal. There is even probably a link between the, the inflammatory uh, responses, uh, how these are stimulated by these intestinal hormones. Uh, whenever you have a... Uh, Whenever you have a low GIP-1 response and a high GIP uh, response, you, you have an inflammatory response, basically. So uh, th these are closely interconnected. Um, yeah, I think yeah, we, we, lack, we lack some studies there, but uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, no, for sure. And uh, I don't mean to put in, but uh, absolutely. So the GIP-GLP-1 balance, which high simple sugars and potentiated by fats with the sugars, the GIP goes high. That was a hormonal view of the problematic mix of uh, sugars, carbs, and fats together. And now I, I think it's very elegant that there's a whole other mechanism whereby simple sugars and fats together may be detrimental, though connected to the hormonal one. I, I agree, absolutely I agree. But this different view that if you eat very high carb, very, very low fat, you're going to have the simple sugars coming in, but you're not going to have the fat transport through the uh, gut lining, which would tend to bring in lipopolysaccharide. So maybe it's not so bad. And then if you eat a really high fat keto diet with very low carb, yeah, you've got the lipopolysaccharides that may come across with the fat transport because you get a lot of fat coming in. But you haven't got the simple sugars to promote the biome that will generate a lot of lipopolysaccharides, so you may be okay. But again, with this whole thing around uh, the transport of fats and LPS, it's the same thing that high simple sugars and high fat together, the donut, the classic modern 50-50 carbon fat diet, is the worst no matter what way you look at it. It's, it's quite uh, elegant, I think. Yeah, and, uh, and actually, when you start thinking about it, it, uh, it makes a lot of sense why you have this uh, huge elevation in GIP and subsequently insulin, because uh, both hormones, in a healthy system at least, uh, are acutely anti-inflammatory. So when, when you trigger a, a high inflammatory uh, uh, response, uh, 
for the resolution, you need a high anti-inflammatory uh, milieu so that uh, basically that, that is done by, by a high uh, insulin response in, in, in this uh, very case. So uh, it, it explains that why you have uh, this additional effect of, of uh, simple sugars and, and uh, long chain fatty acids on, on GIP and uh, subsequently on insulin. Recent studies uh, show that uh, uh, GIP can uh, be responsible for 60-65% of the overall insulin response. So that, that's basically what decides the, the big majority of your insulin response. And uh, insulin, insulin is just a uh, anti-inflammatory hormone acutely. It's not when, when you have chronic hyperinsulinemia, but uh, uh, as long as you have these uh, returning insulin peaks and, and uh, you can handle the, the, the load, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a clearly anti-inflammatory hormone. Yeah. And, you know, just recently I was looking at papers and I'd seen many, many years ago that insulin appropriately spiking can actually be uh, good for endothelial cell health. And in terms of when you have infections, insulin rises to partake in the process of fixing the infection and resolving inflammation. So insulin isn't all bad once it's pulsatile spiking and acute locally. And then when you chronically drive the system into hyperinsulinemia, well, then the kind of everything falls off the bus and the whole, the whole thing falls apart, which is probably what we're seeing with most modern chronic disease. Yeah, um, we, well, then we are back, of course, to the, to the chicken and egg problem of uh, hyperinsulinemia and insulin resistance, which comes first. And... Um, uh, I think a recent study in uh, the Journal of uh, Clinical Investigation uh, gave us uh, some clue how all this may happen. And uh, we are back again to GIP, uh, the upper intestinal hormone, which, which is exaggerated uh, when, when you eat uh, simple carbs with, uh, with uh, long-chain fats. And uh, it was just a mice study it's a mouse study, but uh, what it showed was that uh, uh, frequent high GIP secretion can blunt uh, leptin signaling in the brain. W what does that mean? Uh, leptin is responsible for suppressing uh, appetite, appetite and increasing uh, energy expenditure. So uh, when you kind of overeat or, or you start uh, depositing fat in your in your adipose tissue leptin levels uh, go up and then a signal to the brain that you have enough uh, reserves please stop this uh, heavy eating uh, pattern of christmas and uh, and just uh, you, you you start burning more uh, fat uh, through activation of uh, of uncoupling so browning of uh, white adipose tissue activation of uh, brown adipose tissue and and a reduction in in food intake and it seems that uh, when you overstimulate uh, GIP in the upper small intestines, this very high GIP load in the brain can uh, somehow, um, they, they actually showed the, the mechanism, but it's not very important uh, right now. Uh, it can blunt the, this effect of, of leptin. And then you have high circulating uh, leptin, but you still, the, your brain doesn't sense uh, this level of uh, leptin there is still uh, a sense of uh, low leptin levels which is a signal to to continue eating uh, as much as you can so basically i think that uh, eating the wrong things can plausibly uh, trigger this uh, scientifically uh, called hyperphagia which is uh, kind of overeating so it, it can all start with uh, with uh, with uh, with this overeating signal, and then of course when you have uh, depositing fat, and and uh, together with uh, increasing inflammation uh, and uh, increasing insulin resistance, hyperinsulinemia is the is the response to to cover uh, the lipid outflow from from adipose tissues and uh, somehow compensate for the high leptin and inflammatory uh, signalings. So yeah, then it, it, it initiates a cascade 
and then uh, you are really into into problems. And uh, recently, several studies uh, showed up that uh, that uh, actually the the real problem is not hyperinsulinemia per se, but uh, but uh, insulin resistance. A lot of people say that uh, the problem is uh, hyperinsulinemia, but uh, mechanistically the underlying problem of many, many uh, disease pathways is insulin resistance. Starting in the endoth endothelial wall, when uh, this uh, NOx and, and uh, nitric oxide balance is tilted, and, and uh, in many other uh, tissues, uh, you, you see that uh, all the blood pressure uh, regulation or, or uh, the vasoconstriction, so um, insulin is normally uh, uh, has a vasodilating effect so that it, your, your um, blood vessels are dilated and your blood pressure should go down. And uh, what you see in chronic hyperinsulinemia is still, or in insulin resistance, is uh, um, high blood pressure, uh, which is kind of paradoxical because if you have a high circulating hormone with a vasodilating effect, which is telling to the to the blood vessels that okay, relax and uh, let this blood pressure drop, and you still have uh, high blood pressure. That's uh, that's a little bit of paradoxical, but the explanation. Uh, well, it, I, I think I just uh, tweeted it uh, earlier today that uh, some researchers in Korea found uh, an explanation that it's uh, blunted insulin signaling, so kind of insulin resistance in the, in the insulin signaling pathway. Uh, there is a break, and uh, and uh, even or, or despite the prevailing hyperinsulinemia, this uh, blood vessel relaxing effect is, is lost. Exactly. And I know there were some debates about this in the past. <clears throat> and, you know, some people think that, well, insulin resistance isn't necessarily a problem, and it's really hyperinsulinemia. And I always loved what Joe Kraft said, and he decades ago he said hyperinsulinemia and insulin resistance they are not combatants they are one and the same and for him what that meant was not that they were the exact same but the combination of insulin resistance with hyperinsulinemia is the problem right and if you have insulin resistance locally say on a very low carb diet with low insulin that's only a, a response to a dietary regime, in other words, glucose sparing. But what you're talking about is a, a pathological insulin resistance, generally with accompanying high insulin, trying to get the job done, trying to keep the fat in the fat cells for someone who's diabetic, you know, trying to basically act as insulin acts in, in a correct way. But it's in a milieu of high of insulin resistance because the control systems now have become unhinged. So I, I like to see both of them together, but I agree with you. Yeah, insulin resistance is the fundamental dysfunction and it's concurrent with hyperinsulinemia when you're in trouble. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's rather straightforward when, when you have a look at the normal physiological roles of, of insulin. So it's anti-inflammatory, it should... Uh, relax your your blood vessel wall, uh, the smooth smooth muscle cells, so that reducing uh, blood pressure, dilating the blood vessels, uh, and 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 you you see just the opposite in in insulin resistance. So that's why it's it's the it's the problem of insulin resistance because there is a resistance so that insulin even the high insulin cannot uh, signal through its its normal uh, physiological role. Yes. No, I, li I like the way that's parsed out. And also insulin for sure, you know, in general, it's a positive thing and it makes sense. It's one of the oldest hormones and all of its functions will be positive unless the control system is broken, in which case it becomes part of the problem. There was one experiment and there's some evidence that high insulin alone, when excessive, can go from being a good thing with vasodilation and endothelial health to being a bad thing. Uh, I'm thinking of the famous one in the 50s with the dogs where they injected one leg and they separated it from the, uh, the body and they developed atherosclerosis in a very high insulin concentration leg with 
exogenous insulin. But again, that was over a long period, and the very high insulin, supernormal, could have generated insulin resistance and the accompanying issues in that particular limb. What do you think? Yeah, of course, after a while, it's it's a cascade. It's a self-perpetuating uh, uh, cascade. So higher insulin will will result in in more insulin resistance. That's uh, that goes on and on. Of course, uh, yeah. I think that, that that's normal thinking. Uh, the, the 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 problem has always been uh, kind of pinpointing the the initiator effect that starts either hyperinsulinemia or starts insulin resistance. And I think uh, one one uh, good candidate in in this is uh, is uh, inflammation. Uh, you see, uh, developing hyperinsulinemia uh, very early in in a uh, after an infection, for example, so that uh, you you start seeing this glucose sparing, but this glucose sparing caused not by fuel competition, which is the case when you are on a very low carb diet, for example. Then you have fuel competition ketones and, and uh, fatty acids uh, compete uh, for, for oxidation in the cells and just outcompete uh, glucose oxidation and, and then uh, subsequently glucose uh, uptake. And that, that's what, what you see as insulin resistance. If you measure insulin resistance as glucose uptake into cells, but uh, why should you measure insulin resistance as glucose uptake into the cells? Uh, this is just a kind of a convention. Um, there is nothing which should make it the gold standard of uh, measuring insulin resistance. Why don't we measure insulin resistance as uh, taking up uh, fatty acids into fat cells? Because uh, that's, is, that is at least as important uh, a physiological role of, uh, of insulin to, to stimulate uh, lipid uptake into fat cells. And I think actually that's much closer to the root problem. And this, this uh, brings us back to uh, chylomicron secretion. And uh, it was recently shown that uh, chylomicron secretion, again, this is uh, lipid, digested lipid release from the, from the small intestines uh, into, into, the, into the system, uh, can be influenced by ta simple sugars. So, uh, particularly glucose. Uh, glucose can uh, stimulate uh, kilomicron, chylomicron secretion. And uh, another factor that can stimulate chylomicron secretion is GLP-2, which is uh, co-secreted uh, with the GLP-1. And uh, this hormone, GLP-2, is known for its role in, in the maintenance of, of uh, intestinal barrier. And then uh, what turned out was that uh, glucose and GLP-2 st stimulate chylomicron secretion by very distinct uh, pathways. And what happens is that glucose results in uh, accelerated accumulation of lipids, of uh, triglycerides, within the chylomicron lipoproteins. And uh, this results in uh, huge size. Uh, Chylomicrons, and what GLP-2 does is uh, it increases it increases uh, lymph lymphatic flow. So the the the, the delivery speed of uh, chylomicrons away from the intestines, and this this is I think that these two the difference between the two is is extremely important, because what happens is that uh, uh, when you eat simple sugars together with uh, long chain fats, you will secrete uh, the same uh, number of uh, chylomicrons, but with a lot more uh, lipids in, in each of them. And uh, this, is, this is kind of non-physiological. We are not really prepared to take this hit uh, long term. And then there is a double whammy of uh, getting all these lipopolysaccharides within these huge uh, chylomicrons. So uh, this, is, this is at the very root of, uh, of, of the problems, I believe. Yeah, and that circles right back again to the classic problem that for most people, particularly modern people, it's the mixture of simple sugars. And again, it might be with steel rolled oats or very fiber intact, unprocessed carbohydrates are truly more complex, slow digesting, lower GIP, higher GLP-1. But 
most complex carbohydrates these days that are marketed are not so complex, right? A lot of them are relatively split up very quickly into simple sugars. So we have this standard diet that has a heavy load of relatively simple sugars mixed with, of course, the fats. Now, I wonder if there are some people who seem to be sensitive to fats, and I'm not sure, there may be people that even with lowish carb, but with certain fatty acids, may still have a slightly high insulin or, or an inflammatory response. And I know toll receptor 4 gets involved there too. But if someone has a response to fats that doesn't appear to be ideal in blood markers, is a possible thing to try to go really, really low carb when you're eating those fats, even more than normal? Well, it's it's difficult to tell. I mean, uh, when you when you are into this uh, kind of disentangling uh, the the puzzle or pu putting the pieces together, I think uh, the the personalization is uh, still far down down the road. So it's it's very dif difficult to tell what what uh, our outliers are. So what what the problem is with with outliers, uh, those who who do not react normally, kind of uh, as the majority, to to uh, dietary interventions. It can be a big difference in in uh, microbiota composition, uh, some kind of an overgrowth which is uh, not typical. Uh, it can be an alteration in uh, how their intestines handle. Uh, lipids, or or uh, uh, can be a problem of uh, of an enzyme of uh, chylomicron uh, um, assembling. You know these the same enz enzymes are used as in the adipose tissue, this DGET and, and and all the others. So uh, there are so many so many steps involved that uh, uh, significant just one mutation, for example, in one enzyme can cause uh, significant uh, differences. But I think most frequently is uh, the biggest difference between individual uh, people is in their immune function. So uh, how your immune system developed when you were an infant or, or, or a small child and uh, what you were exposed to, uh, these are hugely individual and uh, almost never taken into consideration that uh, immune function is one of the one of the highest uh, variable in, in in this process yeah individualization that's pretty tricky i mean working out even the core of what's going on here generally is hard enough i guess though we seem to be getting very close to the essence uh, i was thinking as well of the apoe4 people who have extensive heart disease and calcification and there seems to be a sensitivity to cheeses maybe excessive fats and i wondered are they people where microbiome has over decades of processed food that drove the uh, cardiac disease, maybe ended up with a biome and, and, and a scenario and genetic disposition that does actually make them now sensitive to fats. Though I am curious too, um, and the work of Dr. Gundry is all around cheese and animal fats. And I wonder how much is the casein A2 uh, or A1, the cheese's proteins, which may trigger the immune system, and it may actually be a big part of that observation, more than basic animal fats themselves. Yeah, I'm, I'm not an expert on uh, milk uh, proteins, so I, I don't really know much about, uh, I, I know some about the differences, but it's, it's highly plausible that uh, what you are exposed to uh, intrauterine so within the womb or or, or after uh, as, a, as an infant or small child uh, you can get used to I mean you, you can develop immune tolerance uh, towards that and what you are not exposed to or, or alternatively it can trigger uh, problems very early on uh, so I, I yeah I think um, and, and now it's now it's uh, it's becoming uh, clear that uh, between uh, uh, sexes, I mean, uh, uh, male and female, the, the biggest difference is in immune function because uh, females has evolved to deal with uh, the, the huge 
immune stress of uh, delivering, not delivering, but uh, having a baby. So it's a, it's, it's a not non-self, uh, different kind of tolerance and a very different kind of immune uh, system is necessary for that. And th that's why they are more tolerant to, to uh, these kind of diseases as well, uh, at least as long as they are uh, pre menopausal after menop uh, menopause you see uh, all these problems and problems accelerating and and uh, many women just catch up with men uh, with regard to metabolic diseases so uh, and, and it's uh, it's it's in their immune function uh, and then it, it's it's the same with aging what you see is uh, the immune system is a major de determinant of uh, of aging how you age how fast uh, and uh, how and uh, in, in uh, what way and, and these kind of things so once you start uh, looking into immunity then uh, you cannot really uh, cope with uh, comments on on twitter and elsewhere that uh, well inflammation is just uh, there to to repair something or deal with the problem uh, i think we don't fully we still don't fully understand uh, what inflammation is and how it works so actually i, I started using immune activation because people seem uh, less triggered <laughs> when i use immune activation compared to uh, inflammation uh, because yeah, no, yeah. Um, there are so many ways of uh, different types of immune activation when we talk about inflammation, one should be aware that uh, uh, when you have a helminth infection or a bacterial infection or a viral infection, or you have a so-called so sterile inflammation, uh, so it's just an endogenous and internal injury of some kind, your immune system is activated. Your immune system is activated after every single meal. Uh, you see the, the, these cytokines go up and down together with the meal and, and the, these cytokines assist, the, the, for example, the pancreas in releasing the necessary uh, insulin and so on and so forth. So uh, the, 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 the age of uh, immunology has uh, just started in, in the 90s, I think, uh, really started in the 90s. And that's why I had to do a complete deep dive because I graduated in the mid 90s and all this innate innate immunity and uh, innate immune memory and these kind of things were completely uh, undiscovered back then or, or, or were just discovered which takes decades uh, to make it into into textbooks and finally into the education system. Yeah, there's so much in the immune system. I mean, it's basically, I suppose, because it evolved with everything else over such a long period, it's kind of inveigled itself into every aspect of metabolism. So it's not simply a, an attack dog when you get an infection. It's, as you say, it's involved with even digestion of a meal at many, many levels. And uh, what you see is that uh, those people at the forefront of, uh, of uh, these metabolic diseases for example, in uh, cardiovascular disease, just uh, basically stopped discussing uh, different lipoprotein levels and these kind of things. And the focus has been constantly shifting to, to the different kinds of immune activations because it turns out that uh, by the immune activation, you, you are able to explain the differences in, in uh, lipoprotein levels or, or uh, to cholesterol levels or whatever so uh, if, if you step back and take a different uh, perspective on these diseases uh, kind of an immune uh, and immunometabolism perspective what you see is that uh, basically a lot a lot more things can be explained and uh, you, you you don't have to pinpoint single symptoms or, or single markers or, or surrogates or whatever or proxies uh, but you, you can start thinking in a, in a system, in a, in a true system, so that uh, how, how the, the system interacts with the environment and how this is uh, disrupted in disease and how the body tries to, to heal itself kind of uh, with the inflammation and, and how it fails to do so if the trigger persists. Uh, and I think it's, it's, it's absolutely fascinating. And uh, those people... Who, who are stuck uh, at uh, whatever LDL cholesterol or LDL particle or these kind of things uh, are missing out huge in a huge way. 
I, I would agree. And again, I've obviously spent years arguing against the simplistic cholesterol particle theory because, you know, the, the lipoproteins engage in all the digestion, metabolism, engage in the immune system response. Uh, they are intimately linked to insulin dynamics and our hormonal dynamics and even stress. So basically, they're, they're more the, uh, they're the cart, not the horse. Yes, they move up and down and correlate with disease states because they're engaged in the processes. But I agree with you, you've got to look at the actual core processes of what's driving the problem and the root causes, a big part of which is understanding the immune system to really get to an understanding of, of how to resolve it. One thing that has really confused people, I think, over the decades is because lipid lowering had a beneficial effect which tended to track with the degree of response of the person to the uh, pharmaceutical, you know, lower, lower LDL, higher response to the drug, maybe more benefits. It was used to seal the deal that the lipoprotein number was somehow central. Uh, but that's yet another obfuscation, sadly. But I think we're not going to see much change in view there because if there are effective multi, multi-billion dollar uh, products that help with LDL numbers and help with cardiac outcomes, uh, and there are no drugs, products, or paths forward in terms of resolving the immune system and the root causes, at least no profitable ones or actionable ones with simple pills, then this situation's going to stay the way it is for a long time yet. So I guess it's just for us to keep working on the root causes. There is one thing, Gabor, I had a chat with Dr. Malcolm Kendrick uh, in a podcast a couple of weeks ago, and you might not agree with everything he said, but I think he raises some really fascinating points. And one of them does relate to the immune system for sure. The rheumatoid arthritis and lupus and autoimmune conditions can cause massively accelerated atherosclerosis, completely independent of lipoproteins. And he even mentioned, uh, again, one I'm not sure you're so much into, but he mentioned the uh, sickle cell anemia, that he has seen cases of a 14-year-old boy whose younger brother died at four or five years old of a stroke, and the 14-year-old boy himself needed to get a leg amputated because he had so much calcified atherosclerosis throughout his whole body and indeed his leg that he had to get a leg amputated. And that boy's cholesterol was perfectly normal, but the sickle cells through their shape and other immune factors destroyed the endothelium or, or damaged it enough that there was atherosclerosis everywhere in the body. So he was just making the point that there's much closer things to root cause, vastly more important, illustrated by cases like that, where really the, the number of particles is in the halfpenny place. It's just so far remote from, from the real mechanisms. What do you think? Yeah, I, I think uh, what we have, uh, what we really have to work on is uh, finding the unifying mechanisms. And uh, I think Dr. Kendrick uh, has done a great job on uh, on this, uh, in pointing uh, the the um, blood clotting, the, the thrombotic uh, effects uh, as a unifying mechan mechanism of uh, atherosclerosis. So, uh, and of course, it, it's also important to to find uh, the different contributing factors because, of course, in this discussion, for example, we we found uh, the combination of simple sugars and and uh, and uh, long chain fatty acids, kind of a structure-free, ultra-processed food, if you can uh, just give it uh, one name, structure-free, I think, is, a, is a extremely important here, and uh, which is a typical driver of, uh, of uh, metabolic disease, and we discussed the, 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 the pathways, the mechanisms, but there are other initiating factors, so you see sometimes single single compounds or sing, single uh, uh, atoms for uh, not single atoms but uh, single single compounds as, as for example lead lead poisoning or or arsenic poisoning 
or uh, different uh, en en environmental pollutants, BPA, BPS, and, and all these others, which uh, obviously do not go through the same uh, pathway, but somewhere downstream join into this and then uh, a little bit uh, later on, a little bit downstream, uh, stimulate the same uh, detrimental processes. So, so uh, yeah, you, 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 we, we have to find the, the, the unifying mechanisms and, uh, and the, the, all the initiating mechanisms as well, which uh, converge up upon these unifying mechanisms. And uh, yeah, Dr. Kendrick has, has done a great job, I think, uh, pinpointing uh, blood clotting as a, as a, as a unifying uh, mechanism, the direct mechanism of uh, causing atherosclerosis. I think in, in general, what seems to be a unifying mechanism, and, and I have a long uh, Twitter thread on this, is the chronic suppression of uh, autophagy, uh, which means that you are uh, the, the average people, modern people, are never in maintenance, uh, repair and maintenance mode. So they, 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 uh, their, their system is in a chronic anabolic mode, in a chronic immune activation, and uh, not in the, the repair immune type of immune activation, but uh, but uh, the offense or a defense type of uh, immune activation, and uh, just uh, they don't leave enough time for for uh, repairing, uh, because even uh, despite these triggers, and then we are back to, uh, for example, eating eating simple sugars with uh, long chain fats, and and some people uh, might say that okay, but my grandparents uh, always had fatty meat with uh, with uh, mashed potatoes, and uh, they they only developed these problems uh, in their 60s, or 70s, or even 80s, and uh, why? Uh, this has accelerated now, and, and, and then uh, then the, this is the unifying mechanism, because uh, what we the, the the other differences in lifestyle or or the load of uh, this kind of uh, structure-free foods is much higher, and then other uh, uh, lifestyle factors uh, converge uh, on, on on the same. Uh, pathways and uh, just keep the, the average fork in a chronic uh, anabolic state, never uh, cleaning up the system uh, from the inside. And that's what uh, chronic suppression of autophagy basically means. Just a quick break to remind you that this podcast is only possible due to funding from David Bobbitt and the Irish Heart Disease Awareness Charity. For middle-aged people, it is imperative to find out your heart attack risk by getting a CT scan of the heart and your CAC score. The new IHDA.ie website has all the scan resources. Please support us by visiting and sharing widely. Knowing your score, you can take action to stop the disease process and save your own life. It can even be as simple as removing sugar, refined carbs and seed oils, i.e. processed food, from your diet. And now we return to the conversation. Yeah, and that is a major problem nowadays. I mean, those grandparents, the closest they got to processed food really was mashed potato. Uh, but nowadays, we've got foods everywhere that most people don't even think of as bad processed food. They, in some cases, think of it as healthy whole grains and whatnot. So we energy energy density is a proxy for uh, for a uh, lack of structure in in foods because uh, when you eat. Uh, boiled potatoes for example the energy density is still low and this uh, this is uh, represented in in the the these intestinal responses we have discussed uh, so many times uh, so um, and and of course you eat a good load of uh, meat you you add some uh, pickles or whatever some vegetables or salad or whatever uh, people used to eat or start with a green salad and, and eat the meat with the potatoes uh, next. And this is also important. So I think uh, these, these uh, uh, major steps in, in this uh, initiating pathway, uh, you can eat a lot of things as long as uh, there is no simple sugar dumping into your small intestine. So if you, if you if if it's a long digesting uh, this uh, simple sugars these simple sugars are released uh, slowly and uh, you can take up almost as quickly as it appears and there is no food basically for for the microbes left 
they, there is no overgrowth of uh, these LPS uh, producers. And it is, uh, it's a very interesting uh, study I saw that uh, when uh, you eat these simple sugars time and time again, what the body does is it increases uh, glucose absorption. This is absolutely paradoxical. At least at first sight, it seems paradoxical. If, if this accelerated uh, glucose absorption, which will result in the extremely high GIP and uh, following crazy high insulin response, if those are detrimental, why the body still increases uh, glucose absorption uh, instead of uh, trying to get rid of it so that uh, it remains uh, in the, the intestines and goes further down and, and uh, maybe you get uh, develop some gas and, and get rid of it. Uh, I think the problem is exactly that uh, there is something which is, uh, that is even worse than a very high insulin and, and GIP responses, and that is the bacterial overgrowth. Simple sugars hanging around for a long time in, in, the, in the intestines can cause. So that's even worse because that's highly inflammatory and, and there is a threshold with which the body cannot cope with. And uh, beyond that th threshold, you are really doomed because you develop a very severe uh, intestinal inflammation. And, and then you really develop a leaky gut, which meaning that the paracellular leakage of uh, bacteria and, and debris. And paracellular uh, meaning again that between your intestinal cells, and if it goes between your intestinal cells, that it goes straight to the liver. There are no filters uh, like your uh, intestinal immune system, your mesenteric uh, immune system. It hits uh, the liver. Even if the liver has its own filter, uh, it's way beyond its, uh, its threshold that it can keep uh, uh, deal with. So yeah. then it's uh, liver inflammation and cirrhosis and, and the liver cancer and whatever. And you know what? There's a couple of things there I'm going to grab out. Excellent stuff, Gabor. One is, yeah, so the body preferentially absorbs more glucose when a lot of simple sugars come in. And that makes sense by your very description, not to leave an overload of simple sugars for bad biome overgrowth in the intestine. Yeah, that's my, that's my assumption, at least, or speculation, <laughs> because we don't really know. But uh, I, mean, I mean, evolutionary, it makes uh, sense that uh, you do a seemingly bad thing to your system if if there is something even worse which can happen otherwise yeah but and i agree it's it's a speculation or a hypothesis that's fine but it would make sense evolutionary wise because evolutionary there's a seasonal aspect and if you get a lot of simple sugars well bringing them all in and converting them to fats could be good for the winter and also you're doing indirectly what you describe you're getting them out of an area where they could be a problem and it reminds me of the sglt2 inhibitors that tend to stop the glucose transport and send more of the sugars out the bottom end but then i think we've seen with those urinary tract infections inc increasing and yeast infections down in the nether regions so it might be a little sign that what you describe is is quite appropriate you know there are knock-on effects to trying to dump the glucose and of course anyone listening knows just stop eating the glucose if you've got an issue you know don't be trying to dump it out your your ass so to speak yeah i, I find this uh eating for winter hypothesis a little bit controversial because mm. it doesn't really happen in uh, in nature and i'm i i've spent uh, quite some time looking into what happens to hibernating animals which is another fascinating uh, area of, uh, of research. I think we can, uh, we can get uh, such a great uh, understanding from, from what happens to hibernating animals because they become obese, they become insulin resistant, they become hyperleptinemic, so their leptin is also crazy high. And then they, they start this hibernation and get back to, to normal. So uh, you don't even see the effects when somebody is yo-yo dieting. So they, the people gain weight and lose weight and gain weight again. And uh, the, then there are a lot of adverse uh, effects of that. But these are completely missing from, from these hibernating animals. So I think, and, and the, the, yeah, just focusing on the initiation of uh, obesity for these uh, hibernating animals. If you have a look at a grizzly bear, for example, uh, just check out my Twitter feed again, uh, search 
with my handle uh, and and uh, hibernation or hibernating or whatever, uh, and and you will find these uh, studies. Uh, it, it doesn't really happen the same way to to these bears. Uh, they don't eat very simple sugars and and uh, fat together. I mean, they eat uh, salmon. They can eat tons of salmon. They eat berries. But uh, try to eat salmon and berries. You will never get obese. Never. Uh, you can eat uh, as much uh, berries and, and salmon as you want. It's, it's basically impossible. So uh, what happens is, I believe that uh, there is a switch, probably a circadian switch, when, when uh, day, days uh, start becoming shorter or whatever. I, 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 I haven't even look, looked into this part, but there is a switch which makes these animals leptin resistant. And it starts with this switch. They become leptin resistant uh, so that they can eat more and they can uh, gain uh, all the fat. And when they are leptin resistant, and just before winter, they, are, they, are, they have very high leptin levels, they are, very, they are insulin resistant, they have very high insulin levels. But uh, one difference compared to the pathological insulin resistance in humans is that they also have very high adiponectin levels which is an insulin sensitizing uh, hormone released by adipose tissue. In, uh, chronically insulin resistant humans have uh, just the opposite, high leptin and low adiponectin levels. And these bears have very high adiponectin levels. There is a yearly graph I posted on uh, Twitter and adiponectin concentrations closely follow that of uh, leptin. So uh, this may be a way they can cope with this uh, obesity and insulin insensitivity, which is basically just uh, glucose sparing in, in, in their case. It's not pathological at all. Right. I think it's, it's, it's absolutely fascinating. Absolutely. And you know that it might be they are somehow analogous to a very low carb or keto person having a glucose sparing insulin resistance, but they really do have high insulin and high leptin in contrast. But then the high adiponectin shows that it's a benign state, which indeed it is. Garod, Dr. Garod Oli, in one of my early podcasts, actually pointed that out, that these guys have all many of the bad signs, uh, yet they never develop hypertension or the pathological sequelae of, a, of the problem. They have a very special scenario. Now, I will ask one thing that occurs to me, Gabor. So they are eating salmon, a lot of polyunsaturated fats, which you could say are obesogenic, but maybe not necessarily uh, pathogenic, but obesogenic. And they're eating a lot of berries, which are not too simple sugars. They're fibrous as well, blah, blah, blah. Now, if you fed that bear kind of donuts, like true simple sugars, refined starches, and, and modern fats, I'm guessing that bear would get quite a different kind of obesity. Yeah, most likely, yes. I believe uh, perhaps uh, all these uh, types of foods also play a role in uh, how this leptin insensitivity is triggered. Uh, I can only speculate. I, I haven't looked into this, uh, and I should. I have uh, quite a few papers uh, uh, on my table, but uh, yeah, it's uh, it's a lack of time, and I always find something even more interesting uh, to read. Oh, I know, I know the feeling, Gabor. And no, I was being provocative there. I was just thinking uh, to myself as you were speaking. We can also uh, take a, uh, a look from a uh, intestinal perspective. For example, um, the high omega threes in in salmon and uh, cold water fish, what they feed on. Uh, omega threes are known to be uh, reinforcing the, the intestinal barrier function, while omega sixes are uh, can do the opposite. So, uh, if if they uh, have this high omega three load, this may be an insulin sensitizing or adiponectin promoting, and and the, perhaps the gut is is also involved by uh, having a very strong uh, intestinal barrier function. Yes, absolutely. And you know, when, uh, when I mentioned obesogenic in terms of PUFAs or polyunsaturates, I did really mean omega-6. So in fairness, the, sh the salmon would have an insulin sensitizing omega-3 effect, better 
uh, barrier, gut barrier, as you say. So it's a different kind of thing. Uh, I think the circadian, though, switches, I'm sure, are more powerful in bears because of their very nature and probably have an overriding function too, absolutely. I I'm just curious about if you fed them a modern uh, kind of high sugar, high fat diet, would things quite work so well? You know, it also brings us back to what we started and what we're talking about today, the permeability, the leaky gut. So what can cause the leaky gut? Well, we've, we've said the simple sugars overload, sugar and fats together, where the fat potentiates, you know, the responses. I think uh, well, we, we have to make it clear what intestinal permeability is. And um, some, some pollutants and uh, some compounds can really uh, make uh, this paracellular flow. So between the cells, uh, things getting through, uh, this type of permeability can be increased by certain compounds. But the typical problem is not that. And, 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 uh, and uh, I, what I found a major problem in uh, microbiota research and, and intestinal permeability research and in generally the metabolic uh, and and, uh, and the immune activation perspective in, in, in the digestive system is that uh, these uh, microbiota studies use uh, fecal shotgun sequencing meaning that uh, they take a stool sample and scratch the surface of the stool sample and then they they try to determine what uh, kind of bacteria uh, are there uh, in, in that sample but uh, the, the very basic problem, in my opinion at least, is that uh, the, the interaction between food, uh, microbes, and the host uh, metabolism and the host immune system occur not uh, at the surface of your stool or not even in, in your distal uh, large intestines, but it's, 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 uh, it occurs on mucosal surfaces meaning that uh, on the surface of, of your uh, bowels, the, the, the intestines. And when you have a look at uh, the surface distribution of different parts of your digestive system, it turns out that uh, human small intestines uh, at least are at least an order of magnitude larger in surface than the, than the large intestines. So uh, even though there are a lot more uh, bacteria in your uh, large intestines, in your bowels, by numbers, uh, the, the surface area where the actual interaction happens is much larger in the small intestines. And we uh, have so few studies uh, looking at uh, the, the small intestinal microbiota, the influence of diet on the small intestinal microbiota, the small intestinal immune system, the small intestinal leakiness or permeability and these kind of things, uh, there are just a handful of studies. And uh, what we know, the, the vast majority of our knowledge uh, uh, comes from associations from uh, stool samples, which is, I think, is just uh, due to convenience and not uh, due to uh, good science. Exactly, Gabor. They're looking for the magic pill, as always. It's the easy entry, and then find correlations, find relationships, jump to hypotheses, and, of course, run after some profitable <laughs> target. Uh, yeah, and all these, all these discussions about uh, short-chain fatty acids that uh, uh, what's... Uh, Reportedly, are only in the, in your uh, large intestines, in your bowels. So you need to eat a lot of fibers to keep these uh, microbes happy. Uh, there are there are very basic misunderstandings uh, how the host influences the microbiota composition, for example, and uh, how host metabolism, how disturbances in host metabolism can cause disturbances in the maintenance of uh, proper gut uh, flora. Uh, microbiota composition because if if you are not able to burn uh, to run a oxidative metabolism in your intestines then you leak oxygen uh, into the lumen uh, of, of of the pipes of the intestines and then you you are not able to maintain a strictly or at least uh, partly strictly anaerobic so uh, lacking oxygen uh, environment uh, for the necessary microbes 
And if these microbes get uh, oxygen and uh, a lot of oxygen close to your uh, intestinal wall, then these will be not the microbes you want to be close to your intestinal wall. And I That's a very basic problem, which is often often uh, neglected. And then uh, the host, I mean, we have evolved uh, over hundreds of millions of years since there are microbes in, in the digestive systems. Uh, we have evolved uh, together and the host has certain tools how to influence the composition of the microbiota. That is the uh, co composition of mucus, thickness of mucus, uh, there is the... Uh, antimicrobial compounds secreted by immune cells. There is direct immune cell interactions reaching through the uh, intestinal wall. We have a lot of tools and there is the basic metabolism, just uh, sequester oxygen so that they don't get uh, oxygen and then uh, in itself is, is uh, highly protective and promotes a certain type of microbiota composition. We have a lot of tools and uh, nobody seems to talk about uh, this Everybody seems to talk about eating fibers, short-chain fatty acids in your stool, which is completely unimportant. Who the hell cares about uh, the fatty acid, short-chain fatty acid content of your stool? Uh, what, what's really important is the short-chain fatty acid content of your blood, not, uh, not even what happens in your uh, intestines. I mean, yeah, there are, again, there are associations, but uh, we are just at the beginning of disentangling uh, how the actual interaction happens and how different microbial strains, not uh, high level associations of this uh, phyla, what uh, happens and the, the ratio, how it's uh, tilted and these kind of uh, barely important uh, things, but how certain kinds of strains work together with other strains so that the bile acids are handled properly and uh, the, the uh, short-chain fatty acids are synthesized properly and so on and so forth. There are so many uh, details which we just started putting together and uh, people still seem to focus on, on important and easy to measure uh, things. Yeah, but Gabor, in fact, I love that. The, the arrow of cause, of course, as, as always, goes multiple directions. And I, I always say to people about the microbiome, if you want to help eat a healthy microbiome, or so if you want to have one, well, then eat all the right types of foods and maintain your own health. And now you've described not just that, that the foods contribute to a good, if you will, microbiome, but the host, the self, the health of the body and the physiology contributes also to the actual microbiome makeup. So it's a very complex system, but we've seen over the decades again and again, they go for the simplistic, but not quite true answer based on kind of correlations we've seen it with cholesterol we've seen it with damn near everything at, at this point so if we go and and we just run through the leaky gut again before we we roll to a halt the simple sugars and, and other problem foods can drive a poor microbiome and leaky gut and paracellular transport lipopolysaccharide and problems uh, the health of the physiology can also directly affect all of that ve those vectors and the microbiome and the leakiness, uh, as we've described. There's also, I will go through one more, the problematic plant proteins and lectins and gliadin and, you know, wheat germa agrogluten, but particularly lectins that Dr. Gundry and many others uh, promote so strongly. What about the plant world proteins that have a direct deleterious effect on the gut health and tend towards leaky gut. And indeed, when said proteins do come through, paracellular or otherwise, they then contribute to an immune reaction, which can be very deleterious, develop autoimmune or God knows, all the other things associated with over-immune activation by your words. So what about the plant world problematic compounds, which are different ones are probably problematic for different people, and some people are extremely robust to any of them? Yeah, um, I haven't um, looked into this in, in uh, high detail. So uh, yeah, I could say that I, I don't really know. Uh, what I suspect is that uh, these these uh, problems dwarf 
if you don't uh, feed the system with simple sugars. Um, uh, your, your, uh, and, and if you maintain a, a steady low blood glucose level, so no high spikes, no steady hyperglycemia, then uh, and, and you, you eat otherwise whole foods, then it's, it's a minor problem. I, I strongly believe it, uh, it, it must be a minor problem because uh, then you can maintain a, a strong uh, intestinal barrier function. And even if uh, there are uh, small issues here and there, I mean, uh, some, some aggressive molecules penetrating, you can very quickly uh, repair uh, those. Uh, the, the intestinal um, surface, inner surface, uh, is a very highly proliferating uh, tissue so it uh, renews in uh, two to seven days approximately uh, depending on the cell types also uh, so uh, it, it can be quickly repaired if you leave uh, the time for it and if it's otherwise healthy and the host metabolism is uh, healthy and uh, uh, the, your big, biggest problem if, is uh, eating whole food uh, whole plant foods um, but not eating uh, simple sugars, I don't think, don't actually think that it's a major problem. But, uh, but it's, uh, it contains a lot of assumptions. And, and again, I, I haven't uh, looked into this in detail. Yeah, no, fair enough, Gabor. No, absolutely. And it's great to have a, an alternative view as well. There's, there's a lot of people running with the plant as poison kind of whole theme. And I think in fairness, wheat, because we know about celiac disease, and maybe one in a hundred humans will will essentially die uh, if they eat these compounds. There are certainly compounds out there that are that are problematic for many people, but it may be very exaggerated the extent to which that's the case. I think you're saying, and it could very well be that if people were eating a whole foods diet with no simple sugars and getting a lot of nutrient density from meats, fish, eggs you know, to make the physiology really healthy uh, and having stable blood glucose, blood insulin and a, and a very competent immune system, it may very well be that some of these so-called problematic plant uh, proteins are not so bad at all and we could manage them or deal with them, especially if we're not eating six times a day and overloading the system and having no autophagy, to your earlier point, we may very well be surprisingly robust and I think of it like in process control in engineering. If you lower the water level, the rocks begin to appear. So there's many rocks there. But if you keep the water level, your physiological health quite high, these potential rocks of plant proteins may simply never surface. So I, I like that idea. And I think that if people have particular uh, issues that are profound or autoimmune in nature, it seems to be quite a good idea to do an ultimate elimination diet. You know, you've heard about the carnivore movement. But again, after doing the ultimate elimination down to meat and water, where you basically have eradicated everything, you, I suppose, can reintroduce carefully more benign vegetables, broccoli, cauliflower, etc. And maybe just carefully then bring back in all the foods and see where your pressure point perhaps was. I don't. I don't think you you have to. I mean, uh, what I what I would do as a perfect diet for myself. I, I'm also a autoimmune uh, patient myself. Um, I would do a meat, and then I'm when I say meat, it's a kind of an animals, uh, fish, eggs, uh, organ meats, whatever uh, I like, and I believe that uh, those are uh, are healthy uh, foods, and I would eat. Uh, berries uh, ad libitum so uh, as much as i want uh, always the meat first and then then the, then the berries and i think uh, that's a low low stress uh, kind of diet so you can eat certain plants in in high amounts without any problems uh, I, i'm sure because i can myself uh, eat some plants and uh, I have to be more aware of uh, of others uh, doing some some disturbances, some GI disturbances, um, and I literally can feel it in my lower back when I uh, kind of cheat. I can say cheating. Other other people, of course, wouldn't uh, say cheating when when eating the stuffs uh, that trigger me. But 
Yeah, it's 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 quite uh, straightforward by now after many years of uh, experimentation that uh, some some things I can eat uh, some plants in in whatever amounts without any problems, and others uh, even in small amounts will trigger a a response. Well, just because the question is begging now for anyone listening, so berries, yes, and maybe just name a few other plants which you find benign. And then a few plant world things where, as you mentioned, you, you would not do so well. Just to give a rough idea. You mean uh, just list the plants I'm, I'm sensitive? Well, yeah. I mean, a few of the ones you might be sensitive to. I know you had a starches type problem. Yeah, especially grains. Mm. I, I can eat some potatoes as a kind of a dessert. Uh, uh, it's, it, it doesn't seem to trigger uh, a lot of response anymore, uh, even though it's, it contains starch. Probably the starch I eat is, is lower, and it, it may be that uh, it, it everything is about the rate of appearance in the in the small intestines, as we discussed uh, previously. Uh, lack of structure. This is the the major problem, and uh, and uh, if you eat some uh, potatoes and don't don't don't. Uh, think of uh, a huge uh, plate of potatoes but uh, I eat some whole animal foods and then uh, add a little bit of a uh, uh, few tablespoons of uh, potatoes for example uh, to a meal it's kind of a dessert or, or with the last bites of the of, of meats of the meat or, or, or the, the animal food uh, then, then I don't seem to be triggered I can even eat a little bit of uh, white rice without uh, much problems. Again, uh, I eat uh, that as, as kind of a dessert uh, with the last bites of, uh, of the meat. Um, and uh, I, I can eat as much uh, berries or relatively low sugar fruits if I want to, without uh, issues. I think uh, there, there can be another issue if, if you eat a lot of fruits, it can still wreak uh, havoc on your teeth, regardless of your uh, intestinal lack of intestinal problems. So um, that, that's another um, consideration. Yeah. yeah. And, and actually what you mentioned there, the, the, what you can eat, it, it's still a relatively small group of things. For instance, all the other vegetables and, and various legumes and all, you probably- Yeah, once in a while I can eat some, some beans, for example, mm. uh, not huge amounts. But, uh, but I'm really sensitive to beans. I'm also sensitive. Probably I'm, I'm, I'm in general FODMAP sensitive. So if I eat uh, cauliflower, not more than a few bites, or broccoli and these kind of things, it, it just makes me bloated. Ah, and I thought of those as relatively benign in terms of lectins and other supposed problems, but there you go. So you're, you're careful with your plant sources and you place the meats, fish, eggs, and the fatty and protein up front in the meal and then allow the carb at the back end for slow absorption following the the fat and protein down through the intestines which helps helps with the, the glucose spike as well so you will experience almost the same flat glucose line as uh, without those carbs so there is no no punishment uh, in the in that regard and uh, yeah uh, I, I, I cannot feel these carbs uh, in uh, in my lower back. That's the most important things personally, at least. Yeah, that's your that's your bellwether, and uh, that's great. Yeah, so meat, fish, eggs, and all these nutrient dense, you know, ancestral foods, and then some of the plants, and maybe some potatoes or white rice on the back end of the meal, uh, and then other meals. Ideally, only one big meal a day, maybe one more meal should be enough, a couple of meals a day, that's what I find. And maybe the other meal will be, you know, relatively very low carb indeed compared to the main meal. And that's, that's a safe diet, especially for someone who has any immune or, or diabetic type physiology, as you say, it's going to keep your glucose insulin low, it's going to keep your immune reaction low. And probably to close it, it's going to probably keep your leaky gut type phenomena relatively low as well. Yeah, yeah. And I, and I think uh, I have never measured my ketones, for example, but I can imagine that uh, I'm, I'm uh, in uh, ketosis, dietary ketosis every morning. Uh, because uh, even if I eat, let's say, 100 grams of uh, carbs, 
uh, that's mostly in, in uh, whole foods. So slowly releasing, I add it to the end of the meal. And then I, I usually eat in a restricted uh, feeding window, like uh, six hours, for example. I usually eat two meals a day, eat one at eight, nine in the morning and uh, around three in the afternoon. So that's uh, more or less uh, in a six hour window. And then uh, after three in the afternoon, I don't eat anything. So by the morning, I can e easily imagine that uh, those slowly absorbing uh, carbs disappear and, and I'm in uh, dietary ketosis. I, I don't know, and I'm not very much interested in measuring ketones, but sooner, sooner or later, I will come to that. Great stuff, Gabor. Sounds similar to me, though. I, I often go for a breakfast and an evening meal at five or six, or a lunch and an evening meal at five or six, or some days, a couple of days a week, I just do the evening meal at five or six. And like you, a little bit of rice, it's almost, in terms of a phenomenon, it's almost, or philosophically, it's almost a dessert. I see it, that carbon fat mix at the end of the meal with a bit of potato or a bit of rice on the back end of the meal, it's a very pleasurable way to finish a meal while staying low carb. And because of the restricted window, you're kind of uh, cycling in and out of ketosis too. You know, with a bit of autophagy going on there and no overfeeding, really. So it sounds like a good way to go. So on that note, we'll probably wrap it up. Any last thoughts? Because we're going to be meeting up again for sure. So we don't have to cover everything here. Yeah, just, uh, just that what you should really avoid is uh, uh, high glycemic variability and, of course, uh, high continuous uh, hyperglycemia. So um, it, 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 it's, it was shown, I think it was a study published in, in Science, that uh, hyperglycemia, elevated blood sugar, is the ultimate uh, factor that can ruin your uh, gut barrier function. So if you really, if you are really looking for increased intestinal permeability or, or a leaky gut, then uh, just uh, play around with your blood glucose at, at the very high levels all day long and, and you will get it for sure you will get your just desserts <laughs> yeah <laughs> okay it's so a great stuff gabor we catch up next time and just to everyone out there hope you enjoyed the podcast gabor as usual is a font of knowledge deep research and information uh, we are finding that search engines nowadays and and other kind of web-based algorithms don't particularly uh, favor alternative health or alternative hypothesis so uh, just to ask again if you could uh, go to fatemperor.com subscribe down the bottom of the home page that'd be really great to stay up to date with new releases and also ihda.ie that's irish heart disease awareness ihda.ie that makes this podcast possible if you could go on there and share with family and friends for awareness of heart disease prevention that'll really help us too so thanks a lot. Yeah, no problem. And uh, one, one more thing, as uh, Steve Jobs used to say, uh, it reminded me of uh, Google. Uh, I just tried out a alternative search engine. It's called DuckDuckGo. And uh, it works exactly the same way as uh, Google search used to work. So if you just want to get back your old Google without this... Uh, kind of uh, filtering uh, alternative uh, health sites and, and uh, screwing with, with the results, then uh, there are alternative options and it works just as well as Google search used to work. Results should be thrown out as they come. It's a utility, it, it shouldn't be biasing. So sounds like there's other, other alternatives, yeah, maybe to start using. And also, as I mentioned, by subscribing to email lists, you're really staying connected to the people you want to hear from and you can bypass some of this bias. Yeah. Okay, great stuff. Thanks, Gabor. We catch you next time. Yeah, thanks a lot for inviting again. Not at all. Great stuff. Bye now. Bye-bye. Thanks for tuning in, guys. If you're watching on YouTube, you can see my subscribe button in the middle of the screen, a free viewing of the Widowmaker movie on the far right, and myself and Dr. Gerber's book, Eat Rich, Live Long, on the left. Otherwise, please do subscribe to the audio podcast. Thanks.